Hi, this is Mike at Brash Monkey, and in this video I'm going to be showing you some of the many ways that Spreader can be an invaluable tool for pixel artists. Uh, special thanks to Hieroglyph Games for letting me use the art I created for their upcoming game Arcane Ghosts for this video. In a previous video, which I will link to in the description below, I showed how you could use Spreader to create a 2D animation in a higher resolution uh, using the benefits of modern modular animations such as bones and tweening and then export them as sequential uh, images and then process them so that you end up with uh, low resolution reduced color pixel art animations. But there are some benefits that you might not instantly think of uh, for using this sort of workflow to create your animations. Uh, not only is creating the animation itself a lot faster, and especially a, uh, a very nice, nice looking initial rough animation can be created for your client uh, or yourself very quickly to make sure uh, the animation is the sort of thing you need to work within the, the gameplay mechanics. Um, but the other really nice thing is you can, um, let's say for example you were working on animations for a character uh, and then halfway through, you changed uh, some aspect of the visual design of this character. Uh, if you had created the animations in a traditional uh, 2D animation program, you would literally need to go uh, frame by frame and edit the pixels of your, your, your animation uh, to update the, the new designs. So for example, new armor, uh, new helmet type, or something like that, or a change to the weapon would be very, very time consuming and uh, potentially quite prone to errors where you would get uh, strange changes in the uh, sort of anatomy of the, uh, the weapon design or its perspective or things like that. And obviously when you're using a tool like Spryder, you're uh, going to be able to simply change the one image in this case that's used for the weapon uh, and then re-export your animation frames and then just process them as you did with the original animation. Another nice benefit can be subtlety of movement, uh, where if you're using a traditional low-res pixel art tool, uh, it's very easy when you're creating your animation to rely purely on whole pixel movements of things, uh, whereas if you're creating your animation in a high-res uh, in Spryder, and then processing it down, what's going to happen because these animations are tweened uh, and uh, will be reduced to a lower resolution, um, you'll basically get an animation that is not sort of a slave to exact pixel placement. So the final product can have um, some really nice uh, subtlety to the movement that you, you might not necessarily get without a lot of expert uh, expertise and hard work uh, uh, which can be very time consuming obviously. So you can see um, there's all kinds of uh, subtle shifts to the, uh, to the scale of things and the position of things uh, that would take uh, uh, an expert pixel artist a lot of time to, uh, to recreate the same effect if they were doing every frame by hand. And of course while these methods are very handy for a fairly typical uh, animation such as idols, walks, attacks, uh, things of that sort, another sort of a fringe benefit of working uh, with Spryder is let's say you need to create an animation where you have uh, a character or robot or some kind of object that starts as a collective thing and then falls to pieces. Well, the great thing about working with uh, Spryder is your object is created from pieces to begin with. So you can see in this example for this death animation that I created for the centaur, he turns to stone and then crumbles. And that is another type of animation that would be very, very time consuming to do by hand. And what I was able to do in Spryder was create the initial death sequence and then just using the uh, pieces as you can see I deleted the bones so I could just move the sprites individually um, and just created a, uh, a sort of falling pattern you can see the head is the last thing and it hits some of the other body parts and rolls down uh, so this was extremely easy and fast thanks to Spryder 
and then all I did was export it as sequential uh, frames and then process it out to a lower reduced color resolution added the uh, the fade to grayscale and then added the little uh, bits of uh, pixely um, sort of uh, stone particles and dust uh, following the uh, the individual objects down as they fall. There you go. So there's the full depth sequence. And here's another example on how Spriter can really speed things up. In this case, I needed to create a uh, 3D style rotating coin as a pickup for the game. And you can see that's the end result as uh, low res pixel art. And I created that by simply taking the rotating coin from the art pack. Um, here, and it was originally a fairly generic gold coin, and all I had to do was change that image. Let me see if I can find it for you. There you go. So it started out looking like this, and all I had to do was change these images to grayscale, and then uh, change the gold coin face to this customized image here and then export that animation from Spriter as sequential frames and then use the batch process shown in the other video and a little bit of uh, hand cleanup of the edges here and that's what I ended up with and here's a few more quick examples of animations that I was able to create very quickly despite having some fairly subtle animation or uh, a lot of moving independently moving parts. So here's a sort of Medusa character and uh, if I show you the Spriter file it was very easy for me to just make single image snakes um, as sprites attached to the head lawn uh, rotating on their own pivot axis. Um, so there's the idle animation here's the sort of walk and you can see how they translate to low-res pixel art. There we go. There's the walk. And I did the same sort of thing with the Medusa for her death, where she turns to stone and crumbles very easily in the Spriter by taking the uh, taking the pieces and letting them just moving them down so it looks like they're falling. And here is a spider character. You can see the, uh, the nice subtlety uh, in the movement there uh, of the abdomen, the slow movement of the jaw, and very slow uh, rotation of the limbs, which would be extremely time-consuming uh, creating from scratch in a pixel art program. And the death of the spider is a very interesting hybrid of using Spriter to set up the initial animation and then hand pixel art to finish it off. So here's what that looks like. So you can see in Spriter, I did, here's an attack. There's a Spriter coming down on his web, getting hit. There's the idle. Let me turn off the bones so you can see it better. And then there's all I did for the death in the spider, just had the spider fall nicely to the ground, and then I simply started with that last frame of this in the pixel art program and draw in the nice gooey explodey goodness and then dissolve. As you can see, this process of creating animations in Spriter and then exporting and processing them out into pixel art. Uh, can be very efficient. There's some new additions to Spriter's feature set that add even more uh, to your arsenal as a pixel artist. The first new feature that I'd like to show you is um, in regards to this new mode um, option in the menu, or modes, and you can see by default Spriter has smooth sampling turned on. Uh, so one thing that you can do now, if you look here, as these parts are rotated, they're being filtered, so that means, yeah, sure, in high res, that looks really nice and smooth, like modern games, but if you're going for low res pixel art, especially where you want a very specific number of indexed colors uh, in your final output, uh, that can be uh, counterproductive for you. So, if you just 
unselect smooth sampling, you'll see now that instead of uh, smoothly sampling uh, the uh, scaled or rotated or zoomed uh, objects, it now just uses point sampling, so it's not inventing any new color. You'll see the more I zoom in, that every pixel maintains its original color as I scroll through here. So that way, especially if you start with, and I'll, I'll show you this uh, in better detail with an actual piece of pixel art in Sprite or later, um, you know, obviously the great thing is now you can create your very specific indexed color palette for your images and let's say your body part images when you load them in. They're already pixel art with uh, no alpha blended edges and with no extraneous colors. And when you animate them in Spider, it won't invent any new blurry colors that you'll then have to get rid of in the uh, sort of post-processing and cleanup stage. So here's an actual piece of low res uh, index color, 16 color pixel art. And right now he's, in, he's uh, imported as a sequential image animation. There we go. And with uh, smooth sampling turned off, you'll see that even if I were to stretch this sprite, or this image, it is not inventing any new colors or blurring in any way. Same thing if I shrink it. And even rotation, um, you'll see no new colors are invented. But there's yet another new option under the modes menu uh, option here that uh, can be even more useful. And that is full blown pixel art mode, which you'll see I have turned on here now. Um, and what pixel art mode is, it's not only point sampling, but when you move a sprite, it's only allowed to move in whole pixel increments. And what this allows you to do, um, well, several things. Again, it's the, the how much do you want to have to uh, post-process and clean up your frames of your animation. Uh, if you're creating an animation with many moving objects, so let's say for example, uh, here's a low-res Spider logo here. If I want to create an animation where this moves from one place to another, like so, this is moving now in only whole pixel increments, so the image itself is staying exactly the same from frame to frame. So there will be absolutely no cleanup needed in the post-processing uh, to make sure this uh, moving image stays completely intact. And while obviously that's true for exporting as sequential images, the real benefits of Spreader, of course, are if your game engine can recreate the Spreader animations using the Spreader data instead of loading in uh, traditional full frame sequential animations, which obviously is very, very unoptimized. So the real benefits of Spreader are when uh, more and more game engines and custom game engines, of course, can be made to replay sprite or animation data in uh, using the actual body part images, for example. Um, and this is just going to allow you to uh, finally create highly optimized, even low-res pixel art animations uh, and have them play back in your game engine in a super efficient way and allow you to benefit from things like character maps uh, which I'll link to in the description below. Uh, for example, if you want your low-res uh, pixel art game character to be able to acquire new, uh, uh, new equipment, weapons, new armor, things of that sort, uh, there's functionality built into Spryder to make that extremely easy to do within a game engine. And of course, if your game engine is actually using the Spryder data itself, you could benefit not only from having perfect control of the um, duration of each animation frame, whether or not it tweens, and what type of speed curves the tweening is using. But you can also benefit from things like actually being able to create and edit uh, precise collision boxes for all of your uh, frames of your animations. So let's say if you are creating 
a fighting game and you actually wanted the game to, de to be able to detect whether or not the character got hit in the head, the torso, or the legs, uh, you could actually create those collision boxes and actually have them tween as well between all, your, all of your frames. So for example, I just created these three boxes, so I'm going to copy them and I'm going to paste them to all frames. So now we have, we have these boxes that are uh, in all frames and I can move them accordingly so that you can see they actually can move precisely and per frame you can, uh, you can tweak their exact position or even, even in between frames. And there's not only collision boxes, but there's also points which can be used as spawning points. So let's say the character at some point emitted a, uh, a fire, threw out a fireball or something like that, or threw a knife. A spawning point can be used uh, per frame, and you can have as many as you want, um, to not only tell the game engine from where to spawn the projectile, but even the angle. So you'll see as I rotate here, you can see the angle change of the actual point. You can also use Spider to trigger uh, sound effects at any, any given keyframe. And there's even uh, variables that you can set. For example, if you were animating a fighting game character, throwing a punch per frame, you can actually designate uh, the uh, basically the amount of damage that that punch will do if it collides with, a play, with uh, an opponent. And that's it for this video. Thanks a lot for watching, and uh, please visit brashmonkey.com to learn more about Spider and uh, download the free version. Thanks a lot.